to our first public event of the year here at CELTA, the Swedish English Literary Translators Association. Uh, CELTA was founded in 1982, so we're coming up to our 40th anniversary very, very soon. Um, and uh, since our inception, we have served uh, both literary translators from Swedish into English, uh, mostly based in the UK, but elsewhere in Europe and the rest of the world. And we have also served to disseminate the Swedish language literature to the masses. Uh, during coronavirus, we have been taking the opportunity of glories of Zoom to welcome more of you to our public events and to find out more about the kinds of things that we translators do. Um, so some brief housekeeping. Uh, we are using Zoom's webinar feature today, and this means that uh, we can't see you, we can't hear you. So relax, put your feet up, have a cup of tea uh, and take all of this in. Uh, I'm going to uh, hand over now to our um, chair, Alice Olson. I'm going to invite our speakers onto the metaphorical stage. Um, and I will give the floor to you, Alice. Uh, I should add one more thing. If you have any questions for the speakers for the Q&A session, you can actually use the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screens at any point to insert those questions and they are upvotable as well. Okay, thanks very much. Over to you, Alice. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's really lovely to be with you all here, even though it's a, it's a little funny that we can't, we can't see you, um, but I think, uh, you know, it's been a long year of not being able to meet in person, so um, I'm really grateful that we can at least meet on here. Um, and also thank you to Ian and Salta for inviting me to chair this conversation with um, Kira and Saskia. Um, this is a topic that's been on my mind for, for quite some time, I think um sort of uh, a few years ago when uh, this little art by Kate Briggs came out um I sort of started thinking about more um kind of translation as a creative practice and as something that is being done and carried out by by actual people with bodies and lives and um people who also do other things so um this kind of prompted a lot of discussions with colleagues about um translation as a creative practice, perhaps as a creative writing practice, um, and also uh, the kind of other thing that translators do, because I think um, quite a lot of us also have other work and um, other creative practices in our lives. So uh, my name is Alice Olsen. I'm a um, CELTA member and a, a Swedish English translator. I translate in both directions. Um, and with me, I have Kira Josefsson and Saskia Vogel, who are also um, translators from Swedish. And um, I will just begin by, by reading out their bios. Um, I woke up this morning with a terrible toothache, so forgive me for reading straight from here. I just feel like it's better than if I riff completely. So uh, Kira Josefsson is a writer, translator, and editor between Swedish and English. She was awarded a Penheim Translation Fund grant for her work on Pune Rohe's Araben and a Helge Axon Jonsson Stiftelse grant for a fiction project in Swedish about desire, whiteness, and art. Um, her translations have been published in places like Granta, The Nation, and Tupelo Quarterly, and her words can also be read in Svenska Dagbladet, Göteborgs Posten, Triple Canopy, and elsewhere. A long-form piece on the movement to abolish the prison industrial complex is forthcoming in Glanta, where she's a member of the editorial board, and she also serves as assistant translations editor for Anomaly. And with us today is also Saskia Vogel, who is an American author and Swedish translator. Permission, her debut novel about um, erotic awakening and the families we choose for ourselves, was published in four languages in 2019 and is uh, forthcoming in German. She was awarded a working grant from Fafata Fonden in 2020, which she is putting towards a passion project in translation. 
which I also hope we will get to hear more about. Um, this year, she received a, uh, uh, the Berlin Senat grant for uh, non-German language literature for a book she is writing about pornography and the patriarchy. And she is a finalist for the Penn Translation Award for her translation of Jessica Schieffer's Girls Lost. Um, so welcome to my panelists. And um, yeah, I think to, to kind of um, kick us off a little bit, I would love to hear from you sort of the story of how you came to where you are today and um, as translators, but also thinking about your sort of different or various creative selves, um, if you think of them as different, because I know you both, you both write and you both do other things as well. So uh, could I ask Kira to, to start us off a little bit? I'm sure, thank you so much for, for those introductions. Um, thank you, Alice, thank you, Ian and Salta and uh, Saskia as well. Um, I've been talking about this as kind of the dinner party that I've wanted to have for a year now. Um, so it's really nice to be here. Um, so I started translating in a more focused way uh, maybe four years ago, um, but I've always been very interested in uh, language. Uh, my mother tongue, whatever that means, um, is Swedish. I grew up in Sweden, um, but my mom is uh, Finnish and she grew up speaking uh, Finland, Swedish and Finnish, um, and I spoke Finnish as a child. Um, there were other people with other languages um, in my extended uh, family. So we always kind of would jump between different languages um, at dinners and get togethers. Um, as a child, I thought that Swedish was a really boring and small language. Um, I was a kind of a restless and uh, pretty demanding uh, young person, I guess, but um, I do now find Swedish uh, quite lovely, um, but that just like uh, was part of what led me to uh, leave the country as soon as I could. Um, and I ended up going to uh, college in Montreal, um, which is kind of where my English uh, comes from. Um, but I started out as a writer and editor, um, primarily in Sweden and in Swedish. Um, and my second uh, magazine job was at a publication called Bonn Magazine, uh, which is Sweden and uh, London based um, with a Swedish and an English language edition. And that's also where I did my first real um, translation work. Um, but I didn't think of it as a craft uh, then and certainly not uh, an art. It was just kind of a way to move meaning from one language uh, to another. Um, it seemed pretty, unglamorous to me, very pedestrian. Um, but then uh, somewhere along the way after I had moved to New York, where I now live, um, I started to think of translation as a way uh, both uh, to think about writing um, and um, as a way of thinking about the country that I had grown up in um, and that had shaped me, of course, um, but I had spent a lot of time uh, disidentifying with that place. And so it was a helpful way to kind of think about like, who am I and why am I the way that I am? Um, and in New York, I was working uh, in a bookstore cafe as a bookseller and a barista. And um, there was this guy who kept posting up at a table um, with his uh, laptop. And there was something about him that made him look like a translator. Um, so one day I asked, and it turned out that I he was um, and uh, some of you might know him I don't know if he's here tonight but or today um, it was uh, Sam Bett who's a translator uh, from Japanese um, of among others Miyako Kawakami um, and he co-runs the uh, reading series Us and Them uh, at Molasses in New York City um, and it's based on the premise that there is uh, a lot of overlap between translation and other kinds of writing um, just as we're talking about today. Um, and so it was through Sam's generosity uh, that I met a bunch of other translators, um, went to Breadloaf Translators Conference, um, took a workshop with Karen Emmerich, um, and this kind of multilingual, multilingual uh, environment uh, felt like home very quickly to me. Um, and the more translators I met, I realized that a lot of uh, these questions that I spent a lot of time thinking about, uh, about beauty and power um, and how they kind of play out in language uh, were very common um, to a lot of translators as well. Um, and uh, meeting Saskia in Berlin a few years ago was also one of these encounters um, that kind of sparked uh, that translation um, 
feeling of community, I guess. Um, I think this is often the case that we're kind of buoyed by others uh, in everything we do that's worth anything. Um, and so since then, um, translation has been the main part of my work. I started doing that more and more. Um, I mostly translate from Swedish into English um, because I find it harder to do the other way around um, since my life has been lived mostly in English for the past 10 years or more. Uh, but like at least I also translate uh, sometimes into Swedish. Um, and I work with agencies and publishers, sometimes individuals. Um, and I also tend to have a few projects kind of all the time that I've picked up just because I care a lot about them, but where there's no money involved. Um, and then I write in both Swedish and in English, um, but the last few years, most of my writing has been in Swedish, um, partly because I've been interested in writing um, about the US for a Swedish audience um, and partly um, because I really feel like I need to keep that kind of active um, speaking, producing Swedish part of my brain sharp. Um, and I also edit and do textual consultation of various kinds um, for individuals and publishers um, and uh, sometimes a film production company. Um, and I do this both in English and in Swedish. Curious to hear about Saskia. Lovely, thank you so much. That was that was really fantastic um, to hear. And um, I, as a sort of native Swede who's who's moved abroad and lived my um, life or my adult life mostly in English, it that's I can very much relate to to what you were describing in terms of disidentifying and then re-identifying through translation with kind of my home culture and. Um, and uh, I think uh, we are probably not the only ones here also who, um, who can kind of uh, relate to the sort of feeling at home in the translation community, which is also why, again, I'm so happy that we can do these things because um, translators tend to be so isolated to begin with, but during the pandemic, obviously, all of us working from home has been really hard. Um, so thank you so much, Kira. And um, Saskia, would you like to take us through your kind of journey and your creative practices? Oh, I think you're still unmuted. Sorry. I am indeed. Thank you. Um, yeah, and thank you, Ian and Alice and Kira. This is, it's really nice to see everybody's faces. I haven't done a ton of Zoom things uh, this pandemic, so it, it still feels like an absolute treat rather than something that happens uh, all the time. Um, I really related to what Kira said about kind of the switching between languages. That was always a thing in our household as well. My, my mother's mother tongue is uh, German, but she, um, has I guess by now lived in Sweden for most of her life and so I didn't grow up speaking Swedish I, I started speaking it in high school and can relate to that sense of it being like a small language and not really connecting with the literature but I mean what did I know I was like 14 um you know I I think I read like one or two Swedish novels and then declared declared Swedish novels uninteresting <laughs> and I was so wrong um, yeah, and so that's when I learned Swedish was, was in high school. And um, I suppose, how did I get here? I, I um, in, in high school, it was like quite, uh, in high school in Sweden, I, I, I went to three different high schools. And I suppose that was the moment where I realized that of all the disciplines that I was learning in each of the three high schools that I went to, two in Sweden and one in California, language was the thing that was most portable, like it was the thing that really felt like it belonged to me. And so I think it was probably then that like, language really became the thing that I clung to, to bring a sense of, to keep a sense of home with me wherever I was. And there's like, no place where I'm happier than when I'm working with language. Um, I had at university, maybe when I was 18 or 19, fancied working in film and worked with a director for a little while um, in the summers. And, you know, I realized I don't love any aspect of filming, filmmaking, like the actual production of film, as much as I love like toying around with sentences, that if I were proofreading, I would be so content as um, 
just because I, I love being inside language. Um, so I, I started sort of uh, doing freelance writing for um, a fruit and vegetable industry uh, newspaper when I was like 18, 19. Eventually I um, got what was called a master of professional writing. So it's like an MFA equivalent at the University of Southern California, which um, kind of to the point of this, uh, one of the points you raised, Alice, um, it was, they kind of build themselves as like an interdisciplinary writing course. Like you had to, you had to take classes in multiple genres and they were always saying like, if you wanna be a writer, um, you're gonna probably, you're gonna have to do other things. You're gonna have to do writing adjacent things. And all I wanted to be was, um, was a writer and to work with stories. So that kind of idea of um, having lots of, uh, uh, Oh my God, what is the expression? Quivers in my bow? No, okay. <laughs> Thanks to your bow? Thanks to my bow, thank you, thank you. Yeah, um, was kind of ingrained really, really early on in my writing career. Um, for a while, I was back home in Los Angeles after graduating from USC and I worked as an editor at another trade publication, but this time in the porn industry. And I think that's what made me feel very sort of added a a political component to my work because it was, um, I entered that job not really having much an idea of the industry. I just really, really needed a job and I really wanted to work in magazines and it was, it was a good package training and, you know, a proper salary and things. Um, so I really saw it as like my first step into a work, into a life in some form of editorial work. Cause I was, I don't know if I was thinking about literature at the time I was just thinking about like writing articles and the excitement of having a voice in the world or finding cool things and writing about them um but it really informed uh I guess my politics and and my feminism um though eventually I realized that literature is my darling and I didn't think that I was going to be quite satisfied um working in a sort of working with the literature of the trade magazine world. So I went back to London where I'd done my undergraduate work um, because I was like, where does publishing live? And I didn't want to go to New York because for some reason that felt too close to home. Uh, and I was lucky enough to get a job as a publicist at Granta where I had the incredible experience of being able to use any language that I spoke even a tiny bit of in my work and really could use this sort of draw benefit from the fact that I have been a person who's lived between countries for so long. Um, and that was also when translation as a career appeared to me. Uh, I had like the good fortune of, of, you know, just getting to know the names of different translators and seeing how much respect they were given at the magazine and what an interesting job it was. And early career translators would come into the office. Daniel Hahn, you know, very established translators would come into the office. And I thought, gosh, maybe this is something I could do. And all the while I had been working on a novel. So, I mean, you can imagine me like typing on weekends for a decade, not really finding my voice or knowing what. And somewhere around 2013, the idea for my novel really clicked into place as well as the voice of the project and lots of shifts were happening and my husband decided, my husband and I decided that we would kind of leave London and reprioritize our lives financially and reprioritize what we have to work for and just um, go for a life that is more dedicated to the art that we wanted to be doing and translation has been such an unexpected and beautiful gift. Like not only does it sustain most of my life, like it's the majority of my income um, on the on the the one year that I that I don't that um, aside from that one year that I sold my my book. Um, but it's also there's this story about Raymond Chandler that I always loved, and I think after I became a translator, I understood why I liked this anecdote so much. They were they were um, I went on some you know tour walking tour of Los Angeles and the the historians leading the tour were saying that Raymond Chandler used to copy out 
to sort of find his voice as a crime writer, he used to copy out his favorite stories, line by line, word by word, until it clicked, until he understood what it was about this story that made it work, like really understanding the mechanics and the architecture. And I think translation is sort of a really similar practice. And so I feel that it, it's just such a beautiful companion to, it's like an essential piece of, of my writing life. Um, I've learned so much, like I feel like it's possibly the, you know, the perfect compliment to, to anyone who likes writing and has a couple languages at their disposal, I suppose. Um, but yeah, so I, I feel like I never understood how long and what how long a novel was until I finished translating a book. And then you realize that they're finite, they're not infinite. They're infinite in your mind, but they're finite on the page or chapters or line breaks or ellipses and text. And just that sort of intense confrontation and engagement with somebody else's um, spirit. Or as I was re reading uh, Natalie Goldberg's craft book recently, she talks about the words you read on a page are the author's breath in that moment. It's like their breath of that moment captured. And to be so close to somebody's work is um, a huge gift when it comes to my own. Um, I guess I should say I've been working for a translator for about seven years, <laughs> but I think that's it for me. Yeah. Thank you, Saskia. Well, thank you both of you. Um, there's, I've, taken so many notes. This is really, really great. I have a feeling that this conversation is going to spill over and I'm going to have to call you guys afterwards to talk about all the things we won't have time for. But um, yeah, I, I sort of uh, loved um, and could really relate to what you were saying about being the, at your happiest when you're just kind of toying around with sentences, because I think that's something I discovered too. Like I fell into translation sort of sideways, wasn't entirely planned. It was just a job that I could do that came up and I thought, well, I sort of need a job. And then it ended up, ended up being this um, sort of safe haven or just place I could go. Um, and it was just me and the words. Um, and, um, and also as um, some of you probably know, cause I've been very excited and talking about it a lot. I've um, also recently made a big, um sort of um ch life change uh so uh moving back to sweden where i'm originally from which has also partly been like um saskia you and your husband kind of rethinking and reprioritizing life to really make space for um the art and the craft that is important to me and um i think that is um you know what I want us to be talking about today, really, like how we kind of live these practices and these crafts. And, and so my kind of um, first question really is, um, I think I can kind of guess a little bit what your answers might be, but um, whether you perceive your creative selves as different, like, do you think of yourselves as kind of Kira the writer, Kira the translator, Kira the editor, or, um, and you know, obviously same for you, Saskia, or um, are those kind of more intertwined? Um, is it sort of, do you feel like you have multiple creative selves or, or do you feel like it's sort of one whole? Um, and I was wondering if you could kind of ruminate a little bit on that. So um, Kira, could I ask you to go first? Um, yeah, I think uh, this links uh, to a lot of what Saskia was saying um, as well, uh, and the Raymond Chandler uh, uh, idea of co copying down uh, a novel. Um, I came to translation as of writing um, and as a way of understanding writing better, um, just like uh, Saskia was expressing as well. Um, the the first like book that I started working on was Pune uh, Arab and the Arab, um, and um, I picked it up in a bookstore on Yatgatan in Stockholm um, and was drawn to it uh, first because it felt like a story that um, a lot of people in outside of Sweden didn't know about Sweden. Um, and I was like, oh, this would be an interesting perspective uh, to, to bring because I think a lot about um, the kind of maybe more superficial idea of Sweden as this like social democratic uh, egalitarian paradise um, that a lot of people have, uh, whereas reality is more complex than that. Um, 
But then uh, I had no idea how to bring a book into English uh, or how to get one published or whatever. So I really started working on it as a, um, because I loved the language and because I loved the story and because I loved how she had crafted it. Um, and I wanted to understand how she had done that. Um, and so I thought that spending more time with it um, was the way to do that. Um, you know, there's uh, this uh, quote by Gayatri Spivak that translation is the more, most intimate form of reading that's been uh, quoted over and over and over. Um, but there is certainly a truth to that, I think, or there can be. Um, um, so yeah, I think they definitely inform each other for me. Um, editing uh, is a way of uh, having kind of a, a more like birds um, eye view of uh, text work um, and uh, how things hang together in an even like higher up level. Um, and uh, all of these perspectives uh, are kind of interlinked whenever I work, I think um, translation is different in that it doesn't have the kind of horror of the empty page that sometimes uh, strikes <laughs> every writer. Um, and uh, I think like both uh, of you, Alice and Saskia, I, I find it to be um, an anchor. Um, I feel really lost and adrift if I spend too much time not translating. Um, it, it feels like a home to come back to um, where I can think about language, walk alongside another writer um, and then um, I both bring that into my own writing and then I bring my own writing into the translation um, and editing is the top kind of view of that. Yeah, Saskia, please, please go ahead. <laughs> Sarah, I'm really interested in the project that you got the grant for in Sweden. Just wanted to jump in and ask a question because um, I think it might be the project that you had told me about before that takes this like very, uh, like takes a really sort of like close look at translation practice as like an embodied practice. Is that, sorry, I don't want to pull something out of you that you don't want to. Um, it's, it's a different, uh, it's a different project. This is like uh, the, the, the project that I, that's mentioned in my bio is, is a novel that doesn't have to do with translation specifically, um, but it is informed certainly by um, all the things that I think about through translation. Um, but I think, uh, what you mentioned, um, a number of friends and I um, made a, uh, a, put together a panel um, at ALTA, the American Literary Translators Association, um, a few years ago um, that we called uh, Mother's Tongue, Lover's Tongue. Um, that was uh, inspired partly by uh, Madhu Casa's uh, Kitchen Table Translation Anthology, where we were thinking about um, what it means to have language like in our bodies and moving through our bodies. Um, what does it mean to have a lived experience uh, in a language? Um, there's this kind of uh, history of translation into English, especially that uh, is like uh, primarily white translators learning a language, going elsewhere, bringing whatever they think is important or interesting or exotic into English, um, whereas language for most of the world is not lived that way. Um, we live and love in our languages. Um, it's like a very embodied experience. Um, and um, it, we kind of spent a lot of time talking about these questions. And then that became a panel um, that uh, is a uh, brewing book project, perhaps, uh, but one that hasn't um, uh, come to fruition, partly because we live uh, far away from each other. So in those stages but but it has to do with these like how, how 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 is the how is language in our bodies how do we bring that into translation which i think has a lot to do it, it like has a lot of touching points with your um writing i know you've um you and you and alice uh are two people whose translation work and approach to translation i really appreciate and that kind of i know it's like a little cheesy but i feel like both of you make me really energize me um you know, on those days when you're like in the middle of a, there's always a boring part to a translation. Mine is usually checking the book against the text, you know, or like maybe just a day I haven't had enough sleep or just the, the day when it's like the most workmanlike day. Sometimes and you guys, you guys always like keep the fire burning for me. Um, I, I think the separation of these things is, it's interesting to think about because I feel like if you work with language and storytelling, 
you can't really separate them out. But when it's discussed, they're often discussed as separate things. This is a translator who's become a writer. This is a writer who's begun translating. This is an editor who started to write. And I think when we say these things, it sometimes can really kind of, I don't know, it, 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 it asserts a hierarchy of some sort. Like, well, it was the editor who's done this other thing. And then in that gap, there's like a space for, I don't know, it's almost like there's a, let's see if they can make the leap. And I don't know, like with Kira, the, the journey between sort of translation and writing was much more sort of intertwined. Like at, at some point they just started to grow together. And when they started to grow together, that's when, that's when my writing actually, I think got, got um, good. I think it's been really useful to have these different um, types of writing and editing and, and working with text to fall, to fall back on or to relate to. It, it definitely helps me like in an editing process to understand what it means to go through like different levels of edit. Like um, I really valued so much this uh, a, a woman who used to be the copywriter for NASA during the, the technical writer for NASA during the space race. She taught this course at, at my master's program that was like introduction to technical writing. We basically like wrote brochures and, and grants. And, um, and she was like, this is a great career. It pays really well. Look, this is a picture of me with the queen. And her address was like 2020 Sunset Boulevard. Like this was a very elegant and sort of phenomenal uh, woman. And um, I have lost my thought because I loved Shirley so much. Um, oh, right. She introduced this idea of the levels of edit, you know? So the idea that when you when you read a piece, you know, you kind of start wide and then you narrow in. Like, don't distract yourself with punctuation necessarily if you're still thinking about the core ideas of your piece. And to have that from that course, but also from my practice as an editor was really useful. And sometimes I work as a copywriter and um, I usually work for like nonprofits that I really love. And uh, then it's really nice to work with a completely different kind of language, you know, to, to practice communicating in, in a more direct and maybe direct and emotive way rather than something that's about, um, oh, I don't know, something that's not lit uh, literary. And uh, recently, um, for the past three years, I have, a, I have a friend who's a writing partner in Los Angeles, and we finally got our screenplay to a place where it is apparently being sent out and might actually get, and in, with the hopes of it getting sold. And through that process, she's a filmmaker, um, learning this like very structured way of approaching a story for this other format. Also, the type of writing that when you get it in fiction, you call it filmic because it's very, you know, spare. I feel like a lot of Swedish novels have, at least when I first started translating, had that sort of like filmic vibe where the where the narrative voice was sort of like a camera and it was all very spare. And um, but what has been really interesting is as I draft my next novel, I am taking the sort of break the story down into plot points and treatment approach, which I definitely didn't do before. And I'm really excited about plot, which I don't think I really used to care about before. Like, I'm like, oh, I'll figure it out because I know where this is going. But um, yeah, I've got like, I've been like, you know, writing takes so many different forms and writing for me has been note taking and sitting around and thinking about stuff for the past uh, eight months, you know. Anyway, I'll stop that. This is, this is really wonderful. Um, and um, I think, you know, you're sort of uh, going exactly where I was hoping that this conversation was going. I'm looking at my next question that I had put down, which is what are the ways in which your creative practices feed each other? How is your work as a translator shaped and influenced by your other creative work? And I feel like, you know, um, obviously you have already covered this in really interesting ways. Um, and um, I, I um, want to kind of, move on to so before um before we got together i i sent kira and saskia some kind of topics and questions that i thought we would discuss and one of the things that um came up out of that email exchange was the kind of question of um ethos or sort of perhaps the reasons why we do these things or um, be it 
you know, whether we call it our politics or, um, yeah, and I, th I think that that's something that's kind of, um, you know, bubbled up here and there and what we've already talked about. Um, but I'd really love to hear from both of you um, in terms of um, how you feel, like whether you feel like there's a particular ethos guiding you in your work um, and, um, and kind of how important that is. And so, um, I don't know, uh, should we switch it up and go Saskia first? <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. I think it's it's funny with translation because I feel lucky when I get work. And so I often think that I don't have a choice. And I think, you know, uh, but I think maybe it's the, the genius of agents when they're like, I think this translator would match well with this text, or I know this translator has this body of interest, whatever happened. Um, I'm really happy that I seem to have built up in the early years a reputation for um, being able to handle texts that have, you know, like like or strong feminist voices or or strong or stories that don't, you know, that you don't necessarily commonly hear from Sweden overseas. And um, and I've really liked that. And I think to the extent that I've been able to, because I think I just still feel lucky that I that I get work and that work comes to me. Um, you know, I, I, I do what I can to shape that. And I suppose in that sense, like what I write about uh, and what I translate, they also, they, they, they fit together really nicely. Um, yeah, and so, wait, what, I've, lo I've lost the thread, I'm so sorry. I was just um, asking you about the kind of ethos guiding your work. And I think also um, maybe I should add that, I, you know, for the both of you, um, as I understand it, you, you both have sort of projects where you've applied for, um, that, that you've sort of instigated and applied for grant money to do, which is also, you know, I suppose, because you were talking about the sort of being, receiving work and feeling like you have to take that on whatever mm -hmm. comes your way. But obviously that's a, another way to kind of, um, I guess, direct the work a little bit in a particular direction well one of the when i felt like i had some time and space which was time and space i had because my novel had sold and so i had a little bit more like economic wiggle room and, and stuff um it was in that time that also i put together the i had pitched two words without borders this um feature about uh swedish language stories that aren't commonly heard overseas. I no longer remember what the title is specifically, but, you know, Alice, you and I co-translated a piece and Kira brought me an extraordinary piece by Johannes Anjul that had been published in Glenta. Um, and that felt really important because I think, I think, I don't really know when I started thinking this. I'm guessing it's probably been a very long time, but I think I've always understood if you're going to do something, you should be trying to do something to, I don't know, so to be the change you want to see, but just to bring something into the world that's meaningful. And I think a lot of my choices in my life have, have led to me choosing, say, the thing that I think is meaningful and will bring, I don't know, greater compassion or awareness into the world rather than, um, rather than like, I, I don't have a lot of commercial clients, <laughs> you know, um, because I, I do fill my time with things that I feel are like, oh, this, like, su this is super urgent which has its own implications, but, um, but I'm, I'm really proud of what it is that I've been building, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, and just before I invite Kira to come in on that, um, I should, uh, number one, say that uh, Ian has very helpfully um, posted the link to the Words Without Borders um, issue in the chat. And also just remind people to please send uh, or type in your questions in the little Q&A box, because um, we'll return to that later, so just a reminder. But yes, Kira, what, what do you have to say? Um, yeah, also want to put in a good word for that uh, Words Without Borders piece, which is beautifully um, curated and uh, features a lot of really interesting um, voices, including um, Finland Swedish voices, which we sometimes uh, forget uh, when we talk about um, Swedish voices. Um, I, uh, like I mentioned, I think a lot about um, both power and beauty. Um, I uh, in both the structural sense and, and not, I guess, um, I have a background 
uh, my, my formal training is uh, in political theory. Um, I don't think of my work as activism per se. I have like a pretty materialist uh, view of social change. Um, and I think that I like do other kind of organizing work outside of uh, my, my literary work. Um, but I am drawn to stories and perspectives that um, are not the dominant ones and that often speak like counter to whatever um, powers that be and the kind of dominant um, perspectives. Um, I think a lot about, well, when I think about ideas and stories, I think about um, often just because I'm curious where they came from, how they came to be told the way they are, how they came to be told by the people who told them. Um, and I find it most exciting usually to, to hear stories and voices that I hadn't heard before and from perspectives that I hadn't heard. Um, and like I mentioned, I'm also interested in uh, kind of complicating this idea of a um, social democratic egalitarian paradise. Um, I think a lot about social change partly because I'm involved in organizing um, here in the United States. And um, I think like we need stories to understand what things look like elsewhere. And I think if we're like, oh, that's what we want, um, maybe we need to like think about that in a more granular, deeper way. And of course, stories are uh, really interesting and important to, to kind of get a better sense of that and a fleshier sense. What does it mean to have a lived experience in various places and in various bodies? Um, my writing also tends to grapple with these kinds of questions. Um, I'm, I've been especially interested in uh, kind of writing about the US American left for a Swedish audience because I feel like often the kind of reporting from here is like it's the Democratic Party and that's the left and there's actually a lot of really interesting organizing going on so um but see I feel like the world is so big and multifaceted and so rich that it's like an insult to all of our intelligences to like just regurgitate the same stories in the same old ways. Um, I think that transition doesn't like there's sometimes this sense that transition automatically broadens the horizons or like makes things better just because it exists and I don't think that's true uh, partly because of this colonial history around transition. Um, there's been this debate around uh, Amanda, Gor Amanda Gorman's uh, translators uh, on the internet and in various publications um, and around whiteness and race and translation. Um, and I think a lot of what's been said in that debate shows quite clearly that we need to interrogate uh, as translators our own positions uh, as they relate to power um, and aesthetics because I think they are linked. Um, I think all of these questions like having this kind of perspective just automatically uh, will lead to a more rich literary uh, life and interior life probably as well. <clears throat> Thank you that's that's really really um, interesting and um, yeah there's a lot to pick up on I hope that um, people kind of um, that you take down your questions and put them in the in the Q and A because we're we're starting to kind of move towards the end of the time that we have for this conversation bit, um, and to just kind of like go the complete opposite um, direction with this last question, um, I sort of want to ask you um, just in brief if the two of you could reflect a little bit on sort of um, whether you think of all of these different layers to your, or these different creative practices of so writing, translating, um, but also perhaps, you know, organizing all those things. Um, whether you uh, think of all of them as work uh, or perhaps none of them as work, um, what kind of the balance is a little bit, both in terms of time, but also, um, you know, is there, is it the case that you um, engage in certain creative practices in order to support others. Um, so personally, for example, um, I guess I would say that, um, you know, I work as a translator and I get paid to, to do translation work most of the time. Um, but I also do a PhD and that's the kind of writer in me, um, which is self-funded. Um, and uh, I think um, I think of that perhaps less as work and more as um, a passion project, which hasn't always been um, useful because I think that means I tend to sort of prioritize things differently and um, um, feel the pressure of, of sort of, you know, 
um, paying bills and things. Um, so just kind of, if you wanna reflect briefly on, yeah, how you think of your creative selves in terms of work and what, what the balance kind of is for you. Um, Saskia, would you like to go first? I think, I think maybe um, the idea of sustainability is an important one because like, I feel like I've spent and am spending my time trying to make sure that this, this life that I've embarked on and career that I've embarked on um, is sustainable. And because it's sort of all well and good that, you know, I, I worked very little and earned very little in the time that I was, you know, writing my novel, which was the thing that the translation is supporting. Um, but of course, you know, luckily the novel sold and it came out and hopefully there'll be a next one. And, and then, you know, it takes on a, a different meaning, you know, how many books am I going to produce? How many of them will I write and will never sell? Like these kinds of things. And um, so, yeah, I think writing for me is a practice that I know that I have. It's something that is always with me. And I think I, I can relate to it in the sense that it, um, that it doesn't necessarily have to be. I think I would write no, no matter what. And when I'm writing, I think I'm writing in that space of like not necessarily thinking about um, the publishing industry and you know when the next paycheck from a book might come. Um, but of course, you know, that's the space that's in the space of the practice of writing and and everyday life has has so many other concerns like of course I constantly think about you know where as a freelancer like where's the next gig, gig coming from and you know what does it mean if a book that I have on submission now sells now or doesn't sell at all and it's kind of a crazy juggling act um but I suppose yeah, when I think about the publishing industry and writing, that's when it feels like work. But when I'm writing, I try to let it feel like writing, like the thing that I do. And I was fantasizing, like um, I received this grant and I, I haven't spent much of my time focused on the grant stuff because you only find out you get the grant at the end of the year and I had already booked in some contracts. And so I've been translating like a crazy person for the last, um, since, since January. And um, I don't know that I'd want to take a break from translation, but I think that's a really privileged place to be in, to like be in a career where um, I have my, my own time. Because I think what I want to support is time, time to think and time to process ideas. Um, yeah, I don't know. So yes, I suppose it, it, is, it is all work, but it, it's rooted in a different way. Thank you. Um, and um, Kira, would you like to comment as well? Yeah, I, I constantly, um, I, I think the first time, uh, Saskia, that you described to me moving to, to Berlin um, and to be able to actually like support this kind of life, I was, I was like, wow, that's something you can, this is, it's a really beautiful way of um, organizing one's life and one's time, I think. Um, I live in New York City where the rent is too damn high. Um, and uh, so I uh, work, I, in addition to uh, my translation and my writing work, uh, which are both um, um, paid most of the time, though not all the time. Um, I also uh, have worked as a fact checker um, and I have a gig uh, doing due diligence interviews for a finance company. Um, I've also uh, had part-time jobs at like cultural organization as an editor at a translation agency. Um, I've worked uh, at a bookstore as a bookseller barista. Um, all of these things to kind of uh, make sure that I actually have an income, especially as, as an emerging uh, translator. Um, I think without having those kinds of like guaranteed income, um, I wouldn't have uh, been able to do what I do probably uh, because I would have been too anxious about paying that high rent. Um, yeah, um, I think there is this uh, idea perhaps that um, you can't 
I often hear it repeated that you can't sustain yourself on translation work only, um, but I do know uh, a number of people who do, and I think it is possible. Um, you have to be a little bit lucky. You have to be strategic. It, of course, depends on like what kinds of expenses you have, where you live, and so forth. If you have dependents, um, but uh, yeah, for me, it's been for me, it's been this big puzzle of various things, and I, I think I I. Uh, tend to think of it all as work, including my like own writing work, um, because I'm, uh, I always have this little like Luther uh, figure behind my shoulder telling me that I need to do uh, the things that I like need to do, um, which is usually what other people uh, need me to do. So if I don't think of uh, my, my own writing, my own like passion projects as uh, work, I tend to push it off and I don't do it. And that makes me uh, an unhappy, sad person. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, that's, it's really, really interesting to hear you guys reflect on this because this is something I'm thinking about a lot and um, just kind of uh, that sort of notion of how you organize your life. I, uh, like Kira, I'd, I would like to say that, um, you know, I, I also think it's, it very much is possible, I want to say, to, to say to those people who think it's not, very much is possible to, to sort of sustain yourself or to have translation as your main source of income. I mean, it's, it's um, personally for me, it's been mostly luck probably, but, um, um, but you know, it, it also, um, I think has to do with, with how, what you pri choose to prioritize in your life. And for me so far, I've tried to structure life so that I can do these things. Um, I'm now also trying to um, import an American husband to Sweden, which is proving quite expensive because the migration agency needs you to show that you can, um, if you're self-employed, that you can um, support uh, yourself and your loved one for up to two years with your cash savings. So, you know, life throws all kinds of interesting um, surprises your way, um, but, I've always found translation to kind of be a blessing and something that's carried me through all these, all these things that I want to do. Um, so it's been really, really lovely to, to talk to both of you. And I'm hoping now that we can have Ian come in and, um, and help us a little bit with the, with the Q&A part. Um, yes, absolutely. There's there's quite a few questions. Um, if uh, you do have a question for for Kira and Saskia, uh, or indeed Alice, um, then you know hop on down to the the Q and A widget at the bottom and and type it in. You can also upvote questions that you think are good. Um, there's there's quite a good one um, here um, from Brad Harmon, and Brad says um, that you all describe coming to translation by chance or incidentally in some way. Um, and we've already talked about um, material needs and sustainability. Um, and Brad wonders what your take is on the notion that it's necessary to do a lot of unpaid translation for practice so that you can find work as an emerging translator and, and how that resonates with your experiences. I guess, of course, this links back to what you were saying, Saskia, about Chandler copying books. I mean, do we need to be copying books? I mean, Chandler had, I think, a very well-paying job as an executive at an oil and gas company. So I think uh, he could do what he wanted in his free time. Um, hi, Brad. It's nice to see you here or hear you here. Um, I, I'm suddenly reminded of an anecdote because this is also something that is constantly said of the film industry. And I remember the summer that I was working on film, this one woman, I think she was like the second assistant director or something. I. I asked her about unpaid stuff and she was like appalled that I had taken this unpaid internship. And she was like, you do not have to do that. Which I think is a maybe. I think maybe you have to do that because I think unfortunately everything is, I think there's so much in life that that is a lot of luck. It's sort of, and luck being, what is it? Um, preparation meeting opportunity is, is the way that I like to think about it. And um, you have to be lucky to be in the in the in the line of of an opportunity and be able to recognize it and take it on. But I think, yeah, um, I don't actually know. I mean, I haven't done a ton of unpaid translation work, and because I'm a, I think I'm a slow thinker and I'm a slow writer, I don't have a lot of opportunity to take on like unpaid stuff because my unpaid stuff is my writing, and I've had to keep that boundary quite firm for myself. Um, but I, 
a hundred percent think I got really lucky. I also um, had been working in house at a publishing house and was, as I had done the, I think the BCLT summer school was something I had done. Um, one of the editors in the publishing house was generous enough to ask if I wanted to audition for, um, for a nonfiction book as a translator. And that's how I got my start. Um, and then it was a lot of like dogged sort of networking and letting people know I existed and having the uh, completely counter to my normal character, like just like going out there and asserting how that I'm here and I'm definitely worth trusting and, and taking a chance on. Um, so yeah, for me, it wasn't really an option to do this um, with a lot of unpaid work. I would have had to find a different job because I wanted to be supporting my writing when I first started out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I uh, have also done, I have done uh, unpaid, a lot of unpaid work. Um, the way that I got like really got started was because I was really lucky to um, receive the pen time for uh, my translation on excerpt of the Arab um, in that kind of like brought me connections and kind of made me feel more confident as well. Um, and I continue to do unpaid work when I really care about a project. Um, I also in general got my start in like writing and in this world when I was uh, quite young uh, because of a various uh, like coexisting factors, but uh, I was able to take an internship um, because I was able to stay with my parents when I was 19 and live with them and so forth. And I have had that kind of, uh, I, I know that if something terrible were to happen, my family would be able to support me, which is important, I think, when we talk about class, for example, and who can uh, be part of this world. Um, I would, yeah, I think I would not uh, do unpaid work for a publisher or for a, a any sort of like money making entity. Um, and I think that um, we should all try not to do that, uh, partly because that's like scary. <laughs> um, and like brings down pay for all of us. Um, and partly because that is uh, very exclusionary to people who aren't able to do that. Um, and, uh, but yeah, there, it's, it's this complicated thing that has to do with, uh, you know, I think historically like literature has been um, a lot of like unpaid work where people didn't necessarily do this full time. Then there was the MFA where people were able to do it um, full time. And there was this like short golden age of, of magazines and publications paying very well. Um, we've had in the, the US wage stagnation since the seventies, rents are going up. Like it's, it's, a, it's, it's a complicated uh, kind of broad picture um, situation, but yeah, I think it's not it's not a world lot, um, and uh, we should all be talking to each other. I think I'm um, being like having as much solidarity as possible, passing on projects to each other. Um, I know that I've been super helped by Saskia um, doing that with me, for example, um, and uh, kind of giving advice and and. Um, supporting each other because we're freelancers and because we're like you know sitting at our desks independently all the time um but uh yeah i unpaid stuff for people who make money is just wrong i think unpaid stuff because you care and if you can um maybe that's but yeah it's complicated like i said and um, I'm just looking here at, at Susan Vickerman's question, um, which is currently the most upvoted, and, and you've touched on um, you've touched on the issues that Susan raises, but um, she is um, particularly focused on work that isn't necessarily that inspiring, but is work that makes money. I think you both hinted, you know, at the fact that you you cross subsidise certain activities. So we've talked about free work. How do you feel about well paid work that doesn't inspire you? Sorry, <laughs> um, can I just add one tiny thing to Brad's question? I think if we're, before I answer that, I think if, if you are talking about say, breaking into translation and wanting to like bring a certain kind of voice out there, I think maybe if you are doing a sample translation of a book, you're absolutely passionate about trying to get it out there and in that way, like reaching out to publishers and things. I think, I think that's valuable. That's something that I only have the opportunity really to do 
now because of the Fafata Fundman grant. Um, so I'll be working on like that kind of project later, but you know, I had to work myself up to a time when I could get a grant so I could pay for the time that I'm going to spend translating this thing. Um, I would love to have high paying translation work is the short answer to the question. Um, as I said earlier, I just really like working with language and every kind of text um, teaches me something. And I also like having money in my bank account. I mean, I would really love to have some extra commercial work. Um, I haven't been particularly good about going out and seeking it. And I think because I'm, I've been so protective of my writing time, certainly in the between like 2013 and 2019, when my book came out, um, you know, I had to be extremely protective of like what I could and could not do. And um, so I kind of took the work that was coming to me and doubled down in the area that where I saw myself getting more and more work. Um, but yeah, please, please give me higher paying translation work. Uh, yeah, same. <laughs> um, I uh, think, yeah, I don't, there's not, I don't, I'm very, I feel very lucky that I don't do a lot of work that I don't enjoy. Like Saskia, I just love working with text. I don't particularly find fact-checking fun. Um, and I would love to get to a point where I don't have to do that. I find it very stressful. Um, but in terms of the translation and the actual like word and text work, editing, all of that, um, I do feel lucky every day that I sit down at my desk. I love working with words. Just uh, just to quickly come in and add to those questions as well. Um, I think, you know, most of what I had to say has, has been covered in terms of um, the free work uh, aspect. Um, you know, there's a, for historical reasons, um, there is a certain perhaps um, assumption or expectation that translators will do free work, even sort of when we're established. I think I was uh, about a year ago invited to do a sample for a um, large publisher. They've bought the rights to a book that is coming out soon. It was a nonfiction title. Um, I know that we were sort of three or four or maybe a handful of translators who were invited to do a sample and um, just a thousand words so that they would kind of choose who they thought was the right pairing. And um, I was quite shocked to learn that they were not willing to pay us for this sample, um, especially seeing as the book was all about feminism and kind of the economy and how sort of, yeah. Anyway, um, so uh, I think there's an element to sort of just, I mean, I didn't get that sample partly, well, they, they probably just thought someone else was a better fit, but I also kind of got quite upset and, wrote a rather long note about this in my email when I submitted my sample. So I think there's a sort of speaking out about it and sort of um, explaining why this is problematic. Because um, obviously I could afford setting aside the time to do that sample, but there there would be other translators who, who don't have the time and the money to, to do that for free. Um, so kind of fighting that sort of assumption or expectation, I think that we all do this. I mean, cause, cause I do translate um, out of love for language and literature and the craft, um, but I also do it because I, I need to pay the bills and so do other people. Um, and then I also really like what Kira said about being strategic uh, in relation to, to sort of the question about take, taking uh, um, sort of better paid, um, work that is perhaps not quite as inspiring. Uh, personally, I came to a point where I realized that I had been translating for a few years and I wasn't really getting faster necessarily, uh, which meant that I also realized that, okay, yes, I could be getting more work sort of per month, but um, there would ne wouldn't necessarily be like um, what we call learn a career in Swedish. So like I wouldn't be able to sort of increase my income or my salary across my career. Um, that and it did, just didn't quite make sense to me that I would be earning the same starting out as a 24 year old who didn't really know what I was doing and then you know hopefully I'll be doing this my whole life and so I just started trying to kind of in increments when it felt reasonable increase my fee with mostly with returning clients but and and that's not easy and um is I don't know I struggled to I still sort of have to of fight the urge to just quote a lower price because I'm, I'm scared that people are going to say no or go elsewhere. Um, but I think, 
you have to sort of think about, um, you know, look at um, translation and your work and um, your professional self from different kinds of angles, uh, or at least I found that helpful. Um, so in, in the UK, for example, we have the observed TA rate, which can sometimes be a ceiling, can be hard to move um, beyond that with some publishers, but I find it easier to negotiate higher rates with, with agents in Sweden um, for you know, various reasons that have to do with the, the landscape um, and the business, but just kind of, I think it's worth thinking about anyway. Thanks. Alice, can I jump in? I have to tell you a story that is suitable for the group. Alice is the reason why I was inspired to ask for a little bit more from, from um, Swedish clients. And because I've found that UK publishers are basically immovable in this, in this um, translator's suggested rate or observed um, minimum, which is frustrating because that usually uh, it's kind of a toss up whether or not you can get royalties or not. But um, it always surprises me how firm their no is. But I had a huge anxiety, moment of anxiety when the long-standing client who have a really good relationship didn't respond to my email in a timely manner after I'd asked for the rate. And I was like, oh my God, faux pas, like this is the end. And then, and then they wrote back and um, basically said, yeah, sure, you can charge us whatever you want. <laughs> so yeah, it, 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 oh God, the nerves it takes to ask for a raise, but I'm very happy I did. And I'm very grateful to you, Alice, for, for being my inspiration there. Thank you. Uh, that's that's really wonderful to hear. Because I, I hadn't, we hadn't followed up on that after we had that conversation. So I'm really, I'm really glad that worked out. And also, um, I sort of realized that it's a good idea. Just throwing this out there, it's sometimes a good idea to not necessarily tell, or I find anyway, to tell your clients your sort of per word rate, um, because that way they will always be able to calculate the fee and kind of see when you're when you're raising it and instead I've started um, trying to just kind of quote like this is what the full sample you're asking for is going to be and um, they just have to make an assessment every time whether that's a reasonable fee for them to pay. Um, I don't know I've, I've found that helpful um, so I try to avoid telling clients what my what I base my fee on the sort of equation um, because you know really it, it comes down to here's here's a quote is it good for you okay yes um and i you know i don't think that's dishonest or anything i think that's just keeping some of my secrets <laughs> to myself um we've got um just first uh, a comment um from pia lundberg at the swedish embassy in london hi pia um, and she says saskia kira and alice uh, you're also humble saying that you got into translating more or less, because you've been lucky. You can tell that you're all brilliant just by listening to you for a few minutes. Please be proud of that. Without translators like you, Swedish literature would never get international readers. And uh, naturally, of course, we, we all think you're right, Pia, and, and hopefully the audience do too. I wanted to combine here, and with an eye on the time, I'm, I'm going to um, liberally combine three questions here, and you, you may speak uh, on any themes within them that you like. Um, so um, Bab Spicer um, has quite a short and sweet one. She asks, um, how important is it for you to be in contact with the author when you're translating? And I think, especially as you, you have other creative selves, do you get in touch more, do you get in touch less? Does it change that? Um, Fiona Graham asked um, a specific question of, of you, Kira, but I think it, it plays in here, how much you were in touch with Pune Rohi when you were working on Arab and, um, and then as a sort of little um, side diversion from this being in touch with the author, uh, Rachel Rankin um, asks whether you have any experience writing or translating poetry and whether you think that there are, there are differences or opportunities in the creative process compared to writing or translating prose. So yes, you know, the sort of, you, we've talked a lot about straight writing or straight translation, but what about other creative writings. I, I hand it over to you. Does anyone want to, do you feel? Yes. Okay, who wants to start? <laughs> My psychic mind is asking Kira to start. You don't want to start? Do you want to start? 
Uh, sure, I can start. Um, I, uh, my translations into, I've translated more poetry into Swedish. Um, and I, but I recently worked on a, uh, I, I was the editor for um, Fia Backstrom's translation of Åke Hodel's The Marathon Poet, um, which uh, came out on Ugly Duckling a couple of months ago. Um, it's different, definitely, because it's so much uh, tighter. I mean, prose can be very, very tight uh, too, but um, it's just like, you know, both in terms of payment, because it pays less generally, um, and it's just a more, like, you get to sit more with the words, um, which I think is really fun, um, partly because I do, like, because I need to uh, do more prose, um, but I, yeah, it's, it's nice to do both, I think, because it's really nice to get to sit and, like, really, really puzzle over every single, um, word um, in terms of being in touch with the author um, I think we would have wished that we could be in touch with Åke Hodel uh, when we were working on his work he's this like anarchic uh, avant-garde Swedish poet um, from the 20th century um, and uh, a lot of like puzzling mysteries in his uh, work that we would have loved to ask him for he is not with us so that was not possible but uh, in my own work um, I, whenever I can I definitely like to be in touch with the writer um, both because I uh, Think it's fun and I think you know we're so uh alone at our desks as we've alluded to a lot um so it's nice to to talk to people um it can be tricky sometimes because Swedes are good at English um but don't always have like the finger to like it's it's like sometimes people don't really get what you're trying to do and and uh have questions or comments that don't necessarily apply um, and that can be difficult. I've had challenges with that a couple of times but in general um, I, I was in touch and I am in touch with Pune. Um, I hope to work on her new novel that ju just came out, Hölje. It's wonderful um, and I really really uh, cherish that relationship for example and I um, am always glad when, when that's possible. I have sort of a mixed, uh, let's talk about poetry first. I had to translate um, a really fun rhyming poem for a nonfiction book that I did. And that was my first experience translating poetry. And I felt it was really exciting because uh, I had to make such interesting choices, like what to keep in the rhyming scheme and stuff like that. And so I actually ended up like changing bits of the poem because it didn't matter the number of things, it mattered that the number rhymed with the next line. And so, yeah, it's like a really interesting, different kind of um, workout. And then the the project that I alluded to um, earlier is a big poem, and um, but reads more like prose, even though it's so spare. Um, and I'm, you know, just really exciting, excited to have the time to work on that. And um, I don't know. I guess we'll see. I guess I was surprised. Um, I didn't know that when you publish poetry that there will be a poetry editor, or I don't know if that always is the case or is sometimes the case. And I think that both like excited me and, and terrified me because I the process will be unfamiliar, but I think any kind of collaboration is always really illuminating. Um, I guess also because I worry that I might uh, be in, encountering, but I guess, you know what, it would be good. I would, maybe someone would reveal to me um, limitations to my to my craft and then then they will be revealed and can be worked on um i've had a really weird experience recently in my head about thinking about being in touch with authors my general feeling is i love just meeting somebody for two minutes or like watching a video of them and getting their vibe this works better in person and i know it sounds maybe a little wishy-washy, but I just love getting a sense of the person before I sit down to translate their book. Um, the person who, the sort of minutes that I was able to spend with her, um, Carolina Romqvist, I think really just like solidified how I was working on The White City. Um, we didn't talk about translation, we just, we just met up briefly, spoke a little bit about literature. Um, recently I've had kind of a really mixed, mixed experience being in touch with authors because some I've had some authors uh, really demand that that like sentence structures and and, and the, the fidelity to the text be almost absolute. 
and and other authors that are like translate more freely like go ahead take liberties take my short sentences which are very common in sweden and less less common and, and less easy on the ear i suppose in english and you know go ahead mash them together like play and so sometimes it's good to talk to the author just to get a sense of like who they are in that respect um because it actually kind of rattled my confidence recently when when i had made a number of decisions on a translation and then the author was like well this is good but like you need to you need to continue scaling it back and i was just thinking you know what this is exciting like the english language readership is going to encounter a text that um is also very special in Swedish, but is especially odd in English because of a certain stylistic um, and aesthetic features of, of Swedish prose that are more normal um, in Sweden and, and uh, not as common in the US uh, or in, in, um, in English. So yeah, I wish I, I've been trying to get a sense of how good is it to be in touch with the author? How early should one get in touch with an author? And, can, can you know this about a text in advance? And I suppose you can only know um, after the writer looks at it. This is not a, necessarily a, a straight answer, but perhaps it's it's good to have a more, to, to have a less straightforward answer. Um, short answer, yes, good, to get in touch with the author. Reality of it can be a little bit more um, more complicated, as Kira was saying. Sometimes you're trying to do something and it means something in English. Yeah, I don't know. And you want to like translate for style or music and and you know this is what this music would sound like in English, but the music is the, the sense of music isn't translating back to the author or, or something like that. And then you wonder, where am I in this translation? Am I doing the best translation? Am I misunderstanding their voice? You know, it just raises a lot of questions and makes me revisit the text and think about it in um it just gives me a different set of eyes to look at the text. And then I guess ultimately I have to be happy with my decisions and, and trust that my instinct and research and conversations are, are leading me down the right path. Yeah, um, this is really interesting to hear you both comment on because um, uh, I think Saskia and I have talked about um, this a little bit before. Um, so I personally am sort of quite shy with reaching out to to authors. And I think, um, like you were both touching on sort of, um, well, I think just when you when you translate, there's, there's a million ways, um, there's an infinite number of ways to translate uh, a text, every text. Um, and um, I suppose as a translator, you, you make certain choices. And um, ultimately, you have to kind of be able to um, sort of get behind those choices that you've made. And I suppose I've always kind of been, um, well, I, I started out as a translator um, partly because I just sort of love this very intimate relationship that I feel with the words on the page. And I'm kind of, I guess, scared maybe that um, that'll be questioned because I can see that that would sort of rattle my confidence to, to use um, Saskia's words, um, but also because um, I suppose I've, I've, you know, I've chosen to translate something uh, a certain way and um, perhaps the author feels that I should have translated it another way, but ultimately, you know, um, at least for me, the, the more kind of the longer I've been working and the more I do this, the more typically I get out of conversations with others, with colleagues and um, and uh, with authors. And I should also say that I think, you know, every, every project is different because um, I've also found myself, uh, you know, I, I translated Hedi Fid's questions I am asked about the Holocaust. And uh, Hedi, well, at the time she was um, 93, I think. And um, I actually um, went back to Sweden for the summer, like I usually do. And um, Hedi asked me to come to her house um, to, help her uh, with the edits that had been requested by, by our editor at Scribe. Um, because, you know, she'd received them in an email and um, she was struggling to open the file and to, to read because of the, you know, <laughs> the words were small. Um, so uh, there's all kinds of different ways of 
um, I suppose, having conversations and engaging with, with the author. And sometimes it means coming to someone's home and, you know, having coffee and um, helping them open a document. And it's not necessarily a question about like how to interpret this particular um, word or flavor in the text. It can, those conversations, you know, the, it really depends on, on the project and that encounter um, and being there was sort of one of the most powerful experiences I've had as a translator in terms of thinking about um, bringing meaning from one context and one language to another. Um, so yeah, uh, I suppose that's really kind of, um, um, yeah, where I'd like to end on with that question. Um, I'm sort of conscious that we're running out of time a little bit. Um, so, because uh, we've almost been here for uh, 90 minutes, which I think is um, what we have. Um, but yeah, so I just want to thank everyone for, for coming and for listening and tuning in and being there in the audience, even though we can't see you. And uh, thank you so much for, for all your questions. And um, thank you to Kira and Saskia for joining us. And, you know, in such different time zones, we've, you know, here it's 1130 and we've got Kira in New York, which is I think two hours ahead. And then Ian somewhere in Edinburgh, Sussex and Saskia seven hours ahead in Berlin. So it's really wonderful to kind of just all be able to come together um, like this in one space. Um, so thank you so much guys. And um, yeah, I, I think I'm gonna hand it over to you, Ian. Brilliant, thank you very much, Alice. And yeah, I would just like to echo your thanks uh, to uh, Saskia and Kira as well as yourself. Um, it's, uh, it's been a really wonderful conversation and there's been so much food for thought. Uh, and I would like to apologize to those of you in the audience if we haven't got to your questions. Um, there have been so many good ones. I see Anna Vall has asked about um, how we deal with historical authors, and I remember fondly Peter Graves saying at an event 10 years ago that he liked his authors dead. Uh, so there we have it. Um, with that, there's not a lot left to say. Um, I'd like to thank you all um, for coming out and seeing us in your respective time zones. I'm just going to drop into the chat uh, links to both um, CELTA's website um, if you want to find out more about what we do or if you're thinking about joining then um, we accept applications this is not MI5 you actually have to tell us you'd like to join uh, and uh, Swedish Book Review um, which has relaunched um, just before the turn of the year it looks it looks beautiful it really does um, and if you've not had a look I recommend that you go and check it out um, and uh, I would be doing a wonderful editor a disservice if I didn't mention that the latest issue has just dropped as well so stop by take a look it's great beyond that I don't have anything else exciting to add um, it's tea time here I'm, my, my tummy is rumbling um, so I'm very very grateful to you all um, for joining us I'm very grateful to our speakers and uh, hopefully we will see you all again soon somewhere or other, whether it's in cyberspace or somewhere in real life. Thank you very much, everybody, and see you all very soon. Cheerio. Thanks.